Uh, we come before you this morning uh, just grateful and thankful for this building, for this congregation, for our pastors uh, and all the staff here, that we have a place to come and worship you and fellowship with fellow Christians. Uh, we pray that you would be amongst us this morning, that you would um, just be with us and help us to glorify your name, Lord, and give you the praise that you deserve. We love you. We thank you for everything that you do for us here uh, as individuals and as a body. And uh, we pray that you would always be guiding us and directing us. And we pray that you would bless Pastor Scott this morning um, as he opens your word and just anoint him to give us a message that you intend for us to hear. Amen. I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father to you.
perfect. Um, you are good, Father, even though um, we don't always understand what you're doing. Lord, we know that you're working things to our good because we love you. So, Father, this morning, show us more of yourself. Show us more of your son, Lord. Um, allow your spirit to penetrate our hearts. Um, remove anything that's not of you, Lord, and uh, allow us to leave this place changed. We give you that authority and uh, we give you our worship this morning. In your name, amen. Good morning. We are in Psalm 92, speeding our way through the Psalms. <laughs> Psalm 92 has a label, uh, a song for the Sabbath day. Israel had, uh, had two sacrifices on the Sabbath, uh, one in the morning and one in the evening, on uh, just a regular Sabbath day. These weren't the high Sabbath days. And after uh, the exile, after uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians you know, booted the Jews out of Israel, in what was called the diaspora, and they dispersed all over the, the world at that point, uh, these uh, Psalms were in right now, 92 and then 93, became the Psalms of the Sabbath. They are still the traditional Psalms. Psalm 92 is sung at the beginning of the Sabbath, at the morning sacrifice is Psalm 93 at the end. Psalm 94, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, hopefully, uh, was sung at the beginning of the Wednesday uh, sacrifice. And there are several other Psalms that are, have become traditionally associated uh, with those days. So Psalm 92 is connected uh, to a celebration of Thanksgiving. And it was also, by the way, it, it still is the traditional psalm of what the Jews call Sukkot, uh, which means shelter or tabernacle, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the October, September, October time frame. It's uh, uh, really a, uh, a, it's called the uh, a festival, an in-gathering as well. It's the end of the harvest, kind of the end of the agricultural season before they plant the winter wheat. Um, so this is a very familiar psalm to those in the Jewish community. And in this psalm, we find that God's name, his covenant name, Jehovah, is used here uh, seven times. If you, in your Bible, probably in your translation, if you have uh, capital L, capital O-R-D, even though the O-R-D are normally in lowercase type, it'll fool you there for a sec. Uh, whenever you read that, that's the name Jehovah, as differentiated from Lord with a capital L, lowercase O-R-D, or Lord with a lowercase L, or Adonai, or uh, Kyrios in the New Testament. There are a lot of different variations of the term that we translate Lord, and with different meanings. But in this case, we're talking about the covenant relationship uh, with God. And it says here in verse 1, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. So this is designed, as we know from the title, as a song for public worship. Now, by the way, these titles um, were added uh, long before the uh, verses and chapters were added to the Bible. The verses and chapters, for the most part, did not exist in the original writings. The Psalms are, are an exception to that, because each Psalm was distinctly a separate creation in the Hebrew songbook. Uh, but most of the writings, uh, you know, you take Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and uh, First and Second Kings, and etc., and they were written without chapters, without verses. All the letters were scrunched together. You couldn't tell what the punctuation was. It's just punctuation was invented long after the Bible was written, the type of punctuation that we are used to. So we can say with some certainty, well, that verse number maybe shouldn't go there. That's not being unbiblical or adding to or subtracting from Scripture. The verse numbers were added sometime in the 1500s by editors to make things easier. And I'm awful glad they did because it makes referencing a lot easier. Chapters, if I remember correctly, were added somewhere around the 1200s. And that's very helpful too. Uh, but these titles 
a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day, are either original to the writers or were added by Jewish scholars as they compiled these books together into their Bible, the Old Testament. Uh, so we can be pretty sure this is accurate. Really no question there. It was designed for public worship and singing. But nonetheless, this is a, a psalm about worshiping God regardless of the circumstances. That's really the theme. And, and verse 8 is the central theme and therefore appropriately the center verse. There are seven verses before it, seven verses after it. Psalm 8 is, But you, O Lord, are on high forevermore. In other words, the psalmist is giving us there the reason for worshiping God, regardless of what else is going on. And it's because God is just worthy of worship. We don't need a reason, an excuse, circumstance to cause us to worship God. It is good to give thanks to God just because it's good to give thanks to God. And after all, when you think about it, why were we created? People wonder about uh, why am I on the earth? Why are people on the earth? What's my purpose in life? There are books. You can go to a Christian book site, cbd.com or whatever, find dozens and dozens of books on that type of subject when the answer, and I'm not, they're not bad books, I guess. I haven't read them, but I'm sure there's some value in those books. But the answer is simple. If you're wondering what your purpose is and what your life is, maybe your job fell apart or your marriage fell apart or your economics fell apart or your health fell apart or something happened and you're not where you expected to be. Is anyone where they expected to be 50 years ago or 40 years ago? (laughs) I'm certainly not in many ways. But regardless of all that, it doesn't mean I've lost my purpose of life. Because what is your purpose in life? Why did God create people at all in all the mess that came out of it? Because God wants worshipers. That's really the bottom line. Everything else could be going to hell in a handbasket in my life. But if I am a true, sincere worshiper of God, I am fulfilling my purpose for having been created. That's why we, God can be enough in the middle of lots of other stuff, right? So this is a song about worshiping God in the middle of everything. Now, it's made to be sung corporately, but worship is not fundamentally a corporate thing, right? If it's just words of worship, I will sing words of praise. I mean, I can do it. We've all done it. You're singing the song. The words are up there. They're in the hymn book or they're on the screen or whatever. And I've sung this one before, and I can be doing something else. I mean... Half the time I look out at my students in my Bible class, they're all really doing something else. I don't know where they are, but they're not with me, right, Matt? You look out and you go, okay, you know, that's just the way we are. It's not always worship when I'm, quote, worshiping. But corporate worship is nothing unless there are individual hearts worshiping. Corporate worship is desired by God, commanded by God, but it's to be made up of individuals who are worshiping him individually that together To him, see, the corporate worship isn't so much for you and for me, I I don't believe. I can can get just as much pleasure out of worship in my own home with my family or just by myself driving my car down the road as I can coming together with 50 or 60 or 5,000 believers in a stadium someplace, and it can be a great experience. But the purpose of it is it pleases God to have his children get together and, and do that. So there has to be individual worship going on. And where does it come from? Well, verse 1 tells us, and this is so fundamental. I spoke to you guys probably four or five months ago. I think I, think I might have shown a video, actually, uh, by Dennis Prager uh, about thankfulness. If you haven't seen it, you should go see it. Five minutes long. Now, Dennis Prager's Jewish. He's not a believer, but a very, very wise man in a lot of ways. Very profound teacher. He really is. And um, he has a video talking about gratefulness. And among other things, he says, grateful people are happy people. Ungrateful people are unhappy people. And by corollary, if you find someone who's unhappy, you know they're not grateful. For the most part. They can say, oh, I'm grateful. I'm glad I don't have cancer. I'm grateful. No, truly grateful people whose hearts are just thankful are the happiest people on earth. Christians or not. It is possible to be unchristian and happy, right? I was happy most of the time before I was saved. 
I'd rather be unhappy and saved <laughs> than happy and unsaved and be deluded and be happy. But nonetheless, there are unsaved people that have grateful hearts. But there are a lot of saved people that don't, <laughs> too. It tells us here in verse 1, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises. I, I believe one comes before the other. Gratitude for what God has done. Now, look, uh, any of us at some point, and maybe you at this point, I suppose, in your life can say, well, I haven't got a lot to be grateful for right now. Things have just gone sideways <laughs> in a lot of ways. I, I would suggest, that when I was in sales, you know, it was for a long time I was in sales, some people tell me I still am. <laughs> I always tell the kids in my Bible class, remember, when you get out of here, everybody's trying to sell you something and don't you forget it. <laughs> and then I tell them, and so am I. I just think I've got the best product on earth, that's all. I'm now selling something I can believe in, which is very refreshing, right? Um, but I learned something called the Ben Franklin Close. You guys have probably heard of that. Ben Franklin had a way for making decisions. That's where we get it from. And he wrote about it. He said, you sit down, you put a bar across the top of the page and a line down the middle of the page, and you put pros and cons, and you list them. And whichever one comes out longer, that's your decision, right? That was the Ben, and the Ben Franklin close is that. You know, why don't you want to buy this or you do? Well, let me give you the reasons. And of course, you're manipulating your customer and making your list longer than their list because you're better at it because that's what you do for a living and they end up buying the thing and boom, you got your sale, right? That's one reason I got out of sales. Um, but I suggest Ben Franklining your life. Put, put the bad stuff on one side and the good stuff on the other. I promise you, if you are sincere and honest, You'll get done with the bad side, and it might be bad, but you won't ever get done with the good side. I just think about, it's like, you wake up in the morning, it's like, wow, there are eggs down there in the fridge, and I don't even have chickens. That's pretty cool. I don't like chickens. So we have chickens, great, love you. I've been to chicken farms, they stink. I don't want a chicken farm in my backyard, but I like eggs. I don't want to have a cow. Who wants livestock when it's minus 15 degrees in January? Come on. But I have fresh milk in my fridge. I woke up this morning, I was able to wiggle my toes. What do you know? <laughs> we all were able to get up and get here, right? Somehow we got here, got clothes on our backs, food in our stomach, maybe, maybe at this point. There's coffee, didn't have to go to Brazil to get it. It's right there in my downstairs. I mean, there's just, you know what I'm saying? You just go on and on and on. Why did God invent cinnamon? I don't know, but wow, <laughs> yay. <laughs> right? That's a really good thing. Now we invented chihuahuas too, so eh, you know, that goes on the other side. That's over here in the bed, you know. There, that's, that's, a, that's proof that there's sin in the world. So there's going to be some of that. I get it, mosquitoes and stuff like that, I know. But grateful hearts. I remember Bill Maher, who I pray for sometimes. He's this anti-Christian, foul-mouthed comedian who's got a show on HBO or something, and most of the stuff that he says you couldn't put on broadcast television. But I remember him saying one time, he hated it, hated it, when professional athletes would point to heaven. You know, like, thank you, God, and many of them were Christians, right? Looks out, should he give God the finger? That's what Bill Maher said. I'm not trying to be, that, that's Bill Maher. We said it worse than that. And I thought, for all this guy's intelligence, he's an idiot. Just on a non-religious logical level. The guy's a fool, and he's so smart. He's really smart. Because the obvious answer to that is, you all have parents, right? Whether they're alive or dead, you all have or had parents. And aren't you grateful for the things they've done for you? Do you curse them when things go bad in your life? When it all doesn't work out? Of course not. God gave the baseball player the talent and the opportunity, a great talent, I mean, how many people make it into professional baseball? One in a million, right? So they strike out sometimes. Okay, but God, look what you've done. It's very appropriate to thank God for the good and accept the stuff you don't like as much. Thankful hearts, right? Paved, here's a good one. I thought of this this morning. Paved roads, tires with air in them, spring leaf and gas shocks on your car used to be a ride to town in a cattle cart with steel-rimmed wheels, if you were lucky enough to get it, and no suspension would rattle the teeth out of your brain. And some people went all the way from the East Coast to Oregon doing that a couple hundred years ago, 150 years ago. 
and thinking, wow, I got down here from my house. I only live two, you know, four miles away, so two minutes in comfort, relative safety, and just take it for granted. Take it for granted. Get on a plane, fly someplace. My wife and I talk about this sometimes. Missionaries. They would have a funeral service before they left. William Carey, the great missionary to India, right? Had a funeral service and buried a casket when he left. Because he was never coming back. Because he was going to India. He did come back, as it turned out, in his case. I can be in India in 15 hours. And back the next day. It's like, wow. So, now look, I understand that I would give all of that away to have that relationship repaired, right? Because there are more important things than having eggs in the fridge and being able to hop on a plane and get to Florida in an hour and a half or three hours, right? I understand that. But I'm just saying that even in truly difficult times, legitimately difficult times, there is so much we take for granted. These fairies show up at my house. There are fairies that show up at my house once a week and take my garbage away. I never see them. I don't get it. I just take it down there and poof, it's gone. New York City found out how valuable those people were when they had the garbage strike. Bubonic plague. Right? New York City. Do you know New York City? I read this just about a year ago. One of the greatest crises in the history of New York City was... Uh, when uh, horses were the main mode of transportation. People complained about cars, the smog, and the congestion, and the noise, and what a dirty thing it is, and burning oil, and stuff like that. People were dying in New York City before the invention of the automobile because horse manure was piling up in the streets. You couldn't walk anywhere. We don't see that in the movies, right? You see these movies about the old times. You don't see that. It stunk to high heaven. And thank God somebody invented the internal combustion engine, right? Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) For fossil fuels, that's what I say. Proper, properly used. Right? So. Verse 4 even gets more fundamental, by the way, if you look at that for a sec. Verse 4 says, For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work, and I will triumph in the work of your hands. If I have nothing else to be thankful for, all I have to do is look out the window hold my hand up in front of my face for a few minutes and just contemplate the incredible, miracle, complicated system involved in making that work. Thank you, Lord. And I've got one that doesn't work anymore at all. (laughs) My son-in-law just broke his pinky finger. You know, he's a musician by trade, plays clarinet, one of the best clarinet players probably in the country. Guy's like top, top, top level clarinet sax player. Just broke his pinky, not going to heal going to get 80% back. Broke it right there. I said to him yesterday, we were in Rochester having lunch, and I said, well, Arminio, what happens when you get it back? I mean, do you need to bend that, or is it one of these things where you just depress the keys? He says, no, that, that, that finger there is responsible for four or five different keys. You've got to be able to, to do that, you know? He's like, well, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Who knows what will happen? It might heal, it might not. Right? Amazing. Our hands work. <laughs> Pretty cool. It's all of that should be enough to make us get up in the morning, verse 2, and declare your loving kindness in the morning and then your faithfulness every night. Spurgeon, I like Spurgeon. I quote him a lot, I know, but I just think he's, he says things that some of which I wouldn't dare say, so I read Spurgeon and I blame it on him. This is a good one. You ready? Spurgeon said, we talk as if really. He's actually very funny sometimes, by the way. You should read Spurgeon. The guy's got a great sense of humor. We talk as if, really, we were to be pitied for living, as if we were little better off than toads under a log or snails in a tub of salt. (laughs) thought that was good. We whine as if our lives were martyrdoms and every breath a woe, but it is not so. Such conduct slanders the good Lord. It's like, "Ah." right? But just waking up, taking a breath, Gives me plenty of reason to thank him for his loving kindness. And then, verse 2, at the the end of a long day, laying my head down at night, I'm able to thank him 
for his thankfulness throughout the day. Lord, you got me through another one. And Pastor Ray says sometimes, do I believe God heals people? And he goes, here I am. And I know people who've been miraculously healed. It hasn't happened to me. I haven't needed it, really. And some people who need it don't get it. But I know people personally, and you, some of you do too, who have been miraculously healed. One of them goes to church here, Julie Fisher. From one day to the next, boom, years of suffering, and one day, whammo, totally gone, still gone. Debbie uh, Thompson, another one. Bad back, bent, weird back, no more. X-rays, perfect, healed. See, the Lord is there. The Lord intervenes. He, he knows what we need and when we need it and when it's appropriate. But how much, how much more am I going to be able to thank God for his faithfulness at night if I begin in the morning by worshiping him with praise and thanksgiving for the day ahead and being able to get myself out of bed in the morning and et cetera, et cetera, right? Verse 3. So worship him on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute, the harp, harmonious sounds. So instruments in church, perfectly appropriate. I know some people don't think so, but I think the Bible is pretty clear about that. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. Triumph here is a little kind of an odd word, I think. It doesn't mean like, well, triumph is, is really the word there is exult. Not exalt, which is to lift something up. Exalt means to, like, be jubilant, to be elated about something. That's exulting in something. And I think the verse might better read, uh, the verse, uh, I will boast. The right word there probably is boast. Maybe your King James might have boast there. Uh, I will boast in the work of your hands. It's a kind of triumphal boasting that is entirely acceptable to God. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, quotes from Jeremiah when he says, but those who boast should boast in the Lord. Jeremiah goes on a bit further. It's a, it's a, a shortened uh, free quote by Paul. It's not exactly word for word of what Jeremiah said. But those who boast should boast in the Lord. And scripturally, by the way, we're allowed to boast about what? There are three things. We can boast in the Lord. We can boast in the cross of Christ. And the third one actually is kind of my favorite because it was revolutionary in my life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 boasting in our weakness. We're supposed to boast in our weak. We have a tendency to want to hide our weaknesses. I was just talking to someone yesterday who was in a very difficult position, and I said, you want me to share this? Well, not yet. I'm kind of embarrassed. It's okay. That's fine. I've been there too, right? But the Bible says boasting. Here's why it was so important to me when I read it. I mean, I probably read it a hundred times. One day it was like, boop, you know, the Lord just kind of like, here you go, Scott. This is for you, because I'm one who tends to like to make people think of me in good ways, not bad ways, right? We're all kind of like that. We present our best self. And it said, I will, own, I will boast all the more in my weakness in order that the Spirit of God might rest upon me. And I was like, wow, maybe that's what's so wrong with my life. <laughs> I, I don't feel like the Spirit's on me because I'm so careful about being sure people don't know what a wreck I am sometimes. And, right? Boast in my weakness. John the Baptist Parallel verse, had it down pat. I'm going to paraphrase him a little bit here. He said, when the, his disciples came and said, hey, he's doing miracles, he's baptizing people, that's your job. Because John the Baptist came in order to, to get Jesus, and they totally misunderstood, right? But he had a ministry going and had followers. Jesus came along and basically replaced him. Put him out of business, pretty much. Except for yelling at Herod, which got his head cut off. Uh, and John the Baptist said, no, no, no. I, I need to become less. That's the way it works. The only way God can become more in my life is if I become less. I'm filled to the top with me. There's only so much room. My ego's got to go. My self-interest and, and, and my egotism and my condescension and my my impatience and all those things, my lust and my greed and my desire for ease and comfort, those, those have to diminish. And as they do, the Holy Spirit fills in the gap. God just, he will not come against your will and just force his way in, won't do it. You got to open the door and let him in on a regular basis, right? So boasting in our weaknesses, that's one way you do that. 
taking down the facade. So, O Lord, verse 5, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. Now, the senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. So I'm going to use a little bit of strong language here because it's biblical. First of all, meditating on the works of God, not just observing, not just acknowledging, but meditating on, contemplating, and thinking about, and internalizing, deliberate, Lord, teach me from this sunset I'm looking at here. Teach me from the fact that this is the, one of those complicated instruments in the world. Teach me from all of this, Lord. That will bring us to this inescapable conclusion, and that is what? Exactly what God intended. What is one reason for the creation and the way it was put together? Why are sunrises the way they are and the stars the way they are? There is witnesses to us, so we will go, there must be an intelligence behind this. That's why Romans says everybody who doesn't acknowledge that is without excuse because it's been the invisible qualities of God, God have been made plain to them by what is visible. The next logical step, and the, the, the interesting thing here is that the reason that God is able to judge justly is that in order not to take that step, you have to make a decision deliberately to reject it because God built into every single human being a response mechanism to creation, which is there's a God. Every single person, if they don't go down that route, isn't like, oh, I just never knew. I just kind of went this way, and I was born in this country and under this religion, and I kind of did my own thing, and nobody really told me. It's like, no. God built in an automatic response that the human will has to overcome in order to deny. People choose not to acknowledge that there is a God in heaven that, that did all of this. So as we contemplate it, our response should be what God programmed, which is, wow, <laughs> there's an intelligence here. There's a being. That's what it says here. Lord, how great are your works. Conclusion, your thoughts are very deep. There is a brain, not physically, but there is a mind behind what's happened in the universe. Now, a senseless man doesn't know this. Now, the word senseless, bad translation. I mean, just look it up in Strong's Concordance. The, the King James actually has a better translation where it says, the brutish man. I like the, they use the word brutish a lot. Not like Bluto, like Popeye and Bluto, right? Brutish, meaning literally the Hebrew means like a cow. That's what the word is. It's cattle like. When applied to men, people, there's, there's this word in Hebrew here. But what does that mean? Well, a cow is strong but stupid. And I love animals. I really do. I mean, I talk like I don't. The dachshund or, you know, uh, chihuahuas. And stuff. I, I, I had a chihuahua once. That's why I could speak that way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but cows are great animals. I, mean, I don't want to keep one and feed it, but I like, I like eating them. <laughs> I mean, that's one good thing about them. Um, but look, I've got a dog that I love. I, really, I mean, this little dog, you guys have seen my dog, some of you. He's two years old now. She's two years old, little Charlotte. Uh, Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Hi, honey. I think my wife's watching this on Facebook, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> Dumb as a brick. Like a box of rocks, this dog, I'm telling you. <laughs> she has been trained in a few things, but we're two years in. Come on, sit. Uh, but a lovely dog. But, you know, your dog, I heard Pastor Ray say this once too, when he had his dogs, he had two, uh, two labs, Aaron and Moses. Oh, no, Aaron was a lab. Right? Was it Aaron? Was it, yeah. And Pastor Ray says one time, Scott, your dog is never, ever going to look down at his dog bowl and go, oh Lord, I thank thee for the munificence of thy benefits and for the abundance of the supply. <laughs> you know, he's just, it's a dog. Pig, smartest animal in the world. It's a pig. Smarter than a dog? Absolutely. Are dolphins smarter than orcas? I don't know. Maybe so. I guess smarter than an amoeba? Yes. But they're, they're operating on a at the most, like a six-month-old baby level. I mean, right? And that's what he's saying here. People who don't go that route, uh, this is a harsh language kind of because we're taught never to say this, but the Bible does say it, except in our cleaned-up translations. They're stupid. Now, you can say, oh, that, that woman's got a PhD, and that guy's a nuclear scientist, and this person's a brain surgeon. 
and they don't believe it, well, they're stupid. They have an intelligence of a sort, right, of a kind. But it's not, it's not any intelligence that in the end counts for anything. I'm glad they're saving people's lives and inventing medicines and building buildings and getting rockets. I guess we're going to Mars next, I suppose. NASA wants to go to Mars. Great, I'm, no problem. But what's the eternal value in the end? There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end therein is death, right? Now, I'll finish with this because we're out of time. But it certainly seems, doesn't it, in the world today, that the brutish and the foolish and the God deniers are winning, doesn't it? In so many areas, economically and politically and in the world, uh, academia and the media. I mean, it just seems like they're winning. Should we be envious of them? Should we be upset with their success as they dominate, as they manipulate the unfairness of things? I remember reading a book in high school called Oh, the Unfairness of Things. You know, I mean, Ode to the entitled, I suppose, is what that probably is. Well, I think only if our goals are essentially the same as theirs, are they getting what we want? Are we competing for the same thing, for influence, for power? If not, then what are we upset about? Unless I'm competing for influence or power. I don't see that in the Scriptures. Is that why we're here? God looks at things from a totally different perspective, and he asks us, his children to see things just like he does. What is the fate of evil people who succeed spectacularly on earth, even at our expense? Well, we're out of time. So we will pick that up next week. But Lord, I pray today that as we get into the scriptures, Lord, that you would allow it to be what you have declared it to be, and that is a sharp sword, two sharp edges, kind of like a double-sided scalpel doing surgery in our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we would take our cues, our lead from the Scriptures in our thinking, in our actions, in our emotions, those things we consider to be important, Lord. Uh, let us be faithful and filter all that the world has through the Scripture and not the other way around, including our own hearts and our own minds. So Lord, help us today as this morning is just getting underway to worship and praise you in spirit and in truth. And then tonight when we lie down to be able to put our heads on our pillows and honestly say, Lord, you have been faithful once again. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.